Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to our Minnesota Visitors Edition. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Joining us will be the radio play-by-play voice of the Golden Gophers, Mike Grimm. Before he joins us, just a few thoughts and my view from Section 17. There was not a single negative I could find in our performance against Nebraska Saturday. It was a complete performance, and I think a sign of things to come. This week, we stay on the road for a night game against Minnesota. They are 3-2 and two and have been somewhat of a Jekyll and Hyde team so far this year. They look very good for periods, and then the wheels fall off for long periods in games. Probably because this is a very young team, and Coach P.J. Fleck is trying to fit the pieces together on the fly. It hasn't helped they've had numerous injuries at the skill position so far. We are 20-point favorites as of right now. As fans, we might be tempted to say this is a team we should roll. As coaches, you know Jim and staff take the opposite approach. They'll be harping on the fact that this is a big stage for the Gophers, and we will get their best shot. There's no doubt about that. It's another opportunity to get better, take these guys seriously, and take care of business on the road. At his Monday presser, P.J. Fleck was asked, if this was the best Michigan team he's coached against. When you go back and what is the best, which isn't the best, and we've played some really good teams since we've been here, I would say this is probably, um, they are one of of the best. I think that's a subjective answer based on that, and we're kind of in the middle of the film, so I'm not through it all, but we've watched a lot of it. I think they're one of the deepest, for sure. It doesn't matter who is in that football game. It just seems like they're always fresh because they have so many great players. And they do such a great job of rotation, rotating them, and they all make plays. And they are. And, and Coach Har- Harbaugh uh, does a great job of promoting team, 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 team. Right, the fence, right? And I love that. I mean, you, I love that. What he called the fence, you know. Um, but it's true. When you watch their team, they they all talk about the team. They all play for the team. Sometimes you can't tell who's in the game and who just made that play because there are no. You know, just one guy's the star. They're all the stars that make up their team. And that's, that's, that's hard to do. It's hard to create. And I think he's done a great job of creating, I think, one of the best teams in the country. P.J. had high praise for the Michigan defense and head coach Jim Harbaugh. Their defense has seven of the 11 returning starters from last year. And not only that, it's not a freshman sitting behind them. It's another transfer or it's another senior or another graduate. I mean... These guys are good. He's done a heck of a job building that thing, especially with the way college football's changed and done a very good job. And uh, he's one of the best in the business at, at building teams. And anywhere he's been, got a ton of respect for him. One of, the, one of the best coaches in football, period. He was asked what stands out to him about the play and demeanor of J.J. McCarthy. Well, first of all, uh, you know, I got a chance to recruit J.J., not for very long, but I got a chance to, to recruit him and um, – you know, he's very consistent in what he does. He's a, he's a, you can tell he's an overachiever. He's an, he's the ultimate competitor, but not only that, he connects the football team. 
I mean, every time you watch J.J. McCarthy talk in the media, he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about somebody else. He's talking about his teammates. He's talking about what makes – somebody asked him a question about himself. He's talking about, well, these guys make me better. That's a selfless teammate. And you get back to, you know, Coach Harbaugh's defense, and he's all about the team, the team, the team, the team, and, and his players speak the exact same language he does. That's when you know you have something, when the best players – Right, are are not only the hardest workers, but when they're in the media, they sound just like their head coach. Uh, that's when you have something really special, and that's authentic. It's real. Um, but he is he's very efficient in throwing the football. I mean, he's got a high high completion percentage. You know, their run game sets up their pass game and unravels the defense very quickly. They can run the football with efficiency and make the game really short. They control time of possession, and he's a big distributor of that. I mean, he's the ultimate assist, like in basketball. Just continues to collect assists. Very efficient player and uh, ultra competitive, you can tell, and uh, all about the team. So nothing but praise for him. My guest today says this Minnesota team has been hard to figure out. They are better in some phases of the game than he thought they would be and are not playing well in areas he considered strengths before the season. Helping us to get to know the Gophers from the inside is their radio play-by-play voice, Mike Grimm. So stay with us. us today as we uh, get to learn a little bit about Saturday's opposition is Golden Gopher Radio play-by-play voice Mike Grimm. Great to have you back with us Mike. Always great to be on I appreciate it I'm really looking forward to uh, the game Saturday night here in Minneapolis. Well I think we all are Saturday night games always a big deal and most Michigan fans have been able to catch probably bits and pieces of the Gophers so far this year so we'd like to learn a little more today if we could. The Gophers moved to three and two on Saturday with a homecoming victory against uh, the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana. 35-24, that was a tight game until the Gophers pulled away in the second half, wasn't it, Mike? Yeah, Minnesota trailed at the half by three, and then they really did dominate the second half. They got touchdowns on their uh, first two drives. They got a couple of interceptions um, and, and really took control of They were up by 18 with three minutes to go and then gave up a long uh, it was fourth and one around midfield and gave up a long run to, to cut it to uh, to the final margin of 11. But um, they really did control the second half. But it, it did get a little dicey. I know there were some very nervous Gopher fans at halftime. And, 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 Mike, that's really the way this season has gone for Minnesota. It's been a little choppy. There's been some good. There's been some bad. Um, there, there's been some areas where I thought this team would be really strong that they haven't. And then there's been some areas where I thought there'd be, you know, hey, that, that might be a problem issue, and, and they've been pretty good. And I think they're still trying to totally find out their identity on offense, what they, what they want to be. And uh, they got into it a little bit more on, uh, in that second half uh, on Saturday. Well, the Gophers uh, ran for just over 200 yards on Saturday, and the ground game has been very good so far this year. But I know freshman Darius Taylor was out on Saturday and it was running back by committee, but uh, the three guys that got their carries did a good job. Yeah, no question. And I, I think we'll see more of that even when Taylor comes back. Of course, the Michigan native out of Detroit, Wall, the Lake High School, um, had a really good high school career. And the Gophers were able to spot him early in the recruiting process and establish a relationship and were able to fend off some, some bigger name brand schools late in that recruiting process after Taylor had such a big senior year. And he's not disappointed. I mean, he, he got one carry in the opener against Nebraska. I think they felt like as a freshman on opening night, they wanted to, you know, uh, transition him in slowly. And then the next three weeks, he was freshman of the week in the Big Ten. Uh, he got hurt late in that uh, terrible loss to Northwestern in which Minnesota blew that 21-point lead. And as you mentioned, missed last week. But he has really uh, been a difference maker for this rushing attack. And look, there's no doubt P.J. Fleck wants to run the ball. 
I think he believes he has a quarterback, and I believe it as well, just watching him and Ethan Kelly McManus. And this is where I'm talking about they're trying to really figure out that balance of what their identity should be because I think they have a quarterback that has a more you – know, I love Tanner Morgan, the guy that had been here for the previous six years. But um, Ethan Kelly McManus just is a, he has a stronger arm. He's got a little better mobility. Um, and, and I think there's some areas where they can really like, – like his upside, and people will laugh at this and snicker a little bit right now because Ethan's numbers don't pop off the stat sheet and they're not that high when you look at other Big Ten quarterbacks in terms of the stats. But, uh, look, he's got so much talent. His upside – I mean, he, he, can, he can end up in the NFL. He's just a redshirt sophomore. Um, he's really in his first year of starting and, you know, it takes some time. But I, I think they're in this kind of crossroads as to what their identity is going to be. I do think they want to throw more. I do think they want to take advantage of a quarterback who's got a few more tools than what they've had in the past. But I also think P.J. really wants to keep that identity of running the ball as they did this past week. And so they're still kind of fighting through that. And I think it'll be real interesting, uh, you know, when they're going up against the number two ranked team in the country this weekend as to how they're going to try to attack that really, really good Wolverine defense. Yeah, there's no question Kelly McManus has one heck of an arm, and the way Minnesota was running the ball on Saturday, the Gophers didn't sling it around too much. He was 12 of 14, 146 yards. If the Gophers decide to open it up and throw the ball more, that is a very talented receiving core, isn't it? They upgraded through the transfer portal for sure. Um, they still have not gotten Chris Altman Bell back to what we thought he would be. We're a little over a year removed from that horrific knee injury he had last year in the Colorado game and in the non-conference game in September of last year. He did not dress this past week. He's in his seventh year. Uh, we thought he would have a, a bigger factor, but I think I think between confidence uh, of just trusting the process and trusting the knee uh, and everything else, we just haven't seen much of him. So luckily, uh, P.J. Fleck and his staff did dip into the transfer portal, and they were able to upgrade at that spot. Um, Daniel Jackson's a returner. He is their best pass catcher. Um, he had the big toe tap touchdown against Nebraska. He had two touchdowns in the game over uh, the win over Louisiana, and he had a touchdown at Northwestern the week before. He finished last year with two touchdowns in the bowl game and a touchdown in the regular season finale at Wisconsin. So he's on a nice little heater here. Um, he has kind of been the go-to guy. But they they added Corey Crooms from Western Michigan, um, and we've seen that. Um, Lamecki Brockington, who was coming on strong late last year, he had a touchdown at Northwestern. Um, he suffered an injury. We'll find out more about it here as the uh, week goes on. It looked to be somewhat of a catastrophic leg injury. He got rolled up on. He had to uh, take the cart off the field. Hopefully it was just a precaution. But uh, Elijah Spencer is a transfer from Charlotte who then stepped in for him. And he had a couple of big catches in that second half, and it has been a factor. And um, he's going to get more playing time as well. So you're right. There's some talented pass catchers. And then um, the, the one part of the season that we mentioned, you know, there, there's been some choppiness to it um, in a little surprise that Brevin span forward, the multi-talented tight end, big guy, great blocker, great pass catcher, unbelievable athlete, spent much of last year hurtling over defensive backs, uh, could have gone to the NFL and uh, chose to come back because he loved the program, loved the school, thought maybe if he had a real big year, he could work his way up the draft board. And he just hasn't shown um, – He just the, the numbers aren't popping. He He's dropped a few passes, and, um, you know, I think he's healthy. And so maybe this is a weekend under the lights that um, – that, that he um, he has a, a breakout game. I say breakout because, it, you know, it, it, he just hasn't had that uh, remarkably because he is so talented. So we'll see if, if um, he gets, you know, on the same page as the quarterback and, and, uh, and it has, it has an impact. And I think that's, that, that may be one way that Minnesota can make this a contest is if they get him involved a little bit more. But I kind of count him in that group of receivers, even though he's technically a tight end, that it can certainly be a weapon for this Gopher offense. Well, let's talk about that Gopher defense for a minute or two, Mike. Uh, they lost a lot of talent after last season, and that was really a good defense. It looks like the strength of this year's defense is the secondary with Tyler Newbin, who's one heck of a player, Justin Wally at corner. They are a big-time combination, aren't they? They're really good, yeah. And, uh, you know, Wally has all Big Ten potential. Newbin is a returning all Big Ten caliber player. Um, and and they're well, who I would call their second best defensive player, linebacker Cody Lindenberg. He has not played yet. He has some sort of an undisclosed leg injury. Um, it really hasn't been made that clear as to what it is. Um, he, I had him projected as an All Big Ten kind of player. 
Um, and that's a big miss. It's a big loss to miss him. Um, and, and so this defense is also kind of searching for an identity, as you mentioned. Maverick Baranowski has been a redshirt freshman filling in for him at the middle linebacker spot. He's been good, but as freshmen might do, he's made a few mistakes here and there. Um, I mean, he has a bunch of tackles, and he's doing most of the right things. Uh, so so they've, 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 they've survived it, so to speak. Um, and that you're right, this defense has been good now. Last year they were top 10 in points, fewest points allowed, fewest yards allowed. Um, the year before, the same thing, and, and they did have some holes to plug. Um, they got a couple of guys from that team last year that are on NFL rosters on the defensive side, including Jordan Howden at a safety and uh, Terrell Smith at a, at a cornerback spot, one with the Bears and one with the Saints. So, um, so they had some holes to fill. And um, they, they didn't have a particularly good game at North Carolina. But, you know, I don't know how many defenses will because they've got that kid named Drake May who, you know, he's going to be a top 10 draft pick likely. And then um, inexplicably, nobody really can put their finger on what happened in that fourth quarter at Northwestern. You know, the Wildcats just are not a great team, frankly, this year. And they're, they've been struggling and hadn't won a game against a Big Ten team on home soil in I think two years and the Gophers had that game in hand 10 minutes to go they're up 21 points 31 to 10 with the ball and um, inexplicably the it, and it wasn't even a meltdown it was just one of those weird things Northwestern just started making plays and Minnesota didn't and all of a sudden it's overtime and you're left walking away from there just as a if you're a Gopher fan devastated wondering how they lost that game. So um, they, they got to, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just not quite yet clicked like maybe I thought they would. And, um, it, you know, that, that, that makes it a little tricky going against a team that seems to have no weakness anywhere on the field in the, uh, in the uh, Michigan Wolverines. That was a really tough loss, no question, to uh, Northwestern a couple of weeks ago. And I was noticing on some of the message boards there was, um, you know, a lot of chatter from Gopher fans. Uh, they were grumbling, I should say, about Coach Fleck. But, you know, he's in his seventh season. He's 47-29. and 29. Really, that's pretty darn good. But is patience wearing thin in some sectors with uh, P.J. and the fan base? Well, I, I think not. I mean, it shouldn't. Uh, it, it, it absolutely should not. I mean, what he's uh, doing here at a time in which it's really hard, uh, you know, with poor transfer portal and name, image, and likeness, if you're not a has and you're, you know, I don't want to say the Gophers are a has, you know, a have and have not, um, but it's hard uh, now all of a sudden. I mean, there's fear right now. Darius Taylor has been freshman of the week for three weeks, and the Gopher fans are somewhat celebrating that, but also like, uh-oh. You know who's going to come in and swoop with a with a pile and nil money and and you're gone. So it's a hard job. It, it's gotten harder, um, and you're adding more teams in. So you know I, I think that um, and look that was a terrible loss. There's no doubt about it. Fleck would be the first one to tell you it was a bad loss. And sometimes you just it just weird stuff happens. I mean that fourth quarter could play a hundred times, and you might only lose two of them honestly. And it just so happened that 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 was one of those nights and. Um, and so, yeah, fans were mad about that, and um, and, and hopefully they understand that uh, occasionally those those you know that that can happen, and it did, and you got to move on. And um, it's year seven, and, and I think the knock on on Fleck so far has been this: that he has had some opportunities to get to the Big Ten championship game. Uh, they've contended into November. Really, in five of the last six years, the COVID year was a crazy year. Michigan saw that, right? At, at yeah. And we here in Minnesota saw that. It was just one of those weird years. Um, the Gophers were terrible in defense to start that COVID year. And then by the end of the year, we're pretty salty defensively. And, um, you know, so there you go. Uh, and, and so outside of that year, Minnesota's been in the thick of it, heading right into the uh, last week or two in November. And um, they just haven't been able to push past it. And in some cases, it's due to just dumb luck. Quite frankly, the Gophers, I'll say this, having been around now here, this program for 18 years, if there is some program that's due a, a good bounce, a good break, something lucky to happen to them, it's this, these guys, they have uh, been through a lot over the years, frankly, in both football and basketball in terms of the, the weird injury situations and the weird breaks and the weird stuff that happens, some self inflicted and some just dumb luck um even last year you know weird enough mike you know that the gophers with a couple of weeks left look to be in the driver's seat and then they uh, morgan gets hurt and and they lose a couple of games including the whiteout game and um purdue looks to be out of it as well all iowa has to do is end up beating nebraska at kinnick and they don't and purdue kind of backs its way into the big 10 championship game well minnesota was in a similar boat the year before all iowa had to do 
uh, or all all Minnesota, all Nebraska. Minnesota's in the championship game. If Nebraska holds a late fourth quarter lead in Lincoln on Iowa, and Iowa blocks a punt to help win the game in the fourth quarter, yeah. and both those things are out of their control, and both. Now, I'm not saying last year Minnesota could have gotten in, but I'm saying Minnesota was kind of in the same boat as Purdue was last year, and the year before, Iowa didn't cooperate, and the next year they did cooperate with the team waiting for, for good things. And, um, you know, you played yourself into that weird position where you had to get some help. And so some of it's just been kind of dumb luck. Some of it's been self-inflicted. And I think if there's been a knock, it's been in a, in a Big Ten West that's been highly winnable and with a couple of schedules that have been fairly soft, they just haven't quite pushed on. But – uh, again, given the history, Minnesota in the last three seasons, non-COVID, 11 wins, 9 wins, and 9 wins, that's uh, that's nothing to uh, to uh, fire a coach over. No, I agree with you 100%. I think he's done an outstanding job. And this week, as Jim Harbaugh always says, every Saturday is another opportunity to get better. And we've got a big night game in Minneapolis uh, on Saturday. And we all know night games, they're, they're a different animal. Uh, the crowds are louder. It's a big coast-to-coast game. P.J. Fleck is a great motivator. We know that. And I'm sure he knows, and he'll impress upon uh, the Gophers this week, that this is the big stage, and it would be huge for his program to get a W over Michigan, wouldn't it? It would. And I'm interested to see how P.J. Fleck approaches it, quite honestly. He is... He, he, you know, he was a graduate assistant at Ohio State back in 06, and he really took a lot from Jim Tressel as a young GA. And so th- there's a conservative nature to him. There's some risk adverse uh, nature to him. And I'm curious to see what his approach will be as a what nearly 20 point underdog this weekend. Will he take some chances? I mean, I think to win that game, you got to play. You know, on one hand, you got to probably play a perfect game and hope Michigan, you know, uh, you know, sleepwalks a little bit and. You know that's not you know you can't expect that, but if if we're gonna if we're talking Sunday that Minnesota pulled the upset, those might be some storylines, you know, and and you got to hope that that's the case. And then um, the question is, you can't make many mistakes, so do you play it closer to the vest, or because you can't make many mistakes when you're a big underdog, do you say you know throw caution to the wind and if it's fourth and four at midfield, you go for it? Do you send everybody to block a punt? You know, do you blitz all night? I don't know. Uh, they're watching the film and they're doing that. But I, I do think it'll be an interesting observation to see how the coaching staff uh, led by P.J. Fleck approaches this game on, on Saturday night to try to pull off what would be a pretty pretty sizable upset, certainly the biggest upset in the flex time at Minnesota. Oh, absolutely. Final question before we let you get away, Mike, and you and I have talked about this uh, in the past, but the other great thing about this game to a lot of us anyway, it's it's one of the great trophy games in college football, the battle for the little brown jug. And I know both teams are going to learn a lot about that this week. But watching promos for the game, you know, and reading some of the early uh, matchup uh, articles, I have not seen that mentioned once. And do you think this younger generation of fans is sort of losing interest in some of these great traditions like the little brown jug? Yeah, I, I hope not. Um, I, I think part of it, too, is they just don't play every year now, you know. So I'm, I'm even trying to think the last time these two teams played was, what, 20, 2020? Well, it was, was 2020, it? the COVID year, yeah. but no fans were able to go. That was the opener. And then yeah. before that was it 2017, maybe, where, you know, forever in the old Big Ten, you play every year. Um, you know, Michigan, I think, is once – I mean, it's crazy. They've won like 44 of the last 47 or 40, 50, something like that in this. Um, but I, I hope not. I, I, but I do think part of it is that they just – you know, it's not something that's every year. Like, I can tell you locally here, the Gophers play for some great rivalry trophies, including the Jug, which, uh, you know, is, is the oldest sports trophy in college football. Yes. It's the oldest one. It's the oldest rotating trophy. I think it, its origins go all the way back to 1903 when, I don't know, they were taking stagecoaches to games from Ann Arbor <laughs> to Minneapolis, I think. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And, and, and to the point where, like, a 22-cent Jug was important enough to ship back, and that's how it got all started. Um, but the Gophers also play for Paul Bunyan's axe against their border rival, uh, you know, Wisconsin. And that is – the Gophers have won that two in a row. That's prominently displayed at the uh, Gopher football complex, as you'd guess. And uh, they play for Floyd of Rosedale at, I, you know, the border rival Iowa. And those trophies are never forgotten. I think there is something to the fact and – th- and those rivalries happen every year. I do think there's something to the fact that now with this new fangled Big Ten, and it's only going to get worse now with 18 teams next year, where the Gophers in Michigan might only play twice every, what, eight, nine, ten years, depending yeah. on how the schedule unfolds. And, and so I, I would I would blame it more not on the younger generation, uh, but more on the fact that just it's the way college football is is, uh, is headed in that, uh, 
they're just not playing that thing every year. But um, I can tell you this, on our radio broadcast last week, um, uh, the Little Brown Jug had a prominent uh, role in our post-game show in, in promoting looking ahead to uh, to this game on Saturday because I love it. And um, the Gophers haven't had it very often, so it even makes it more special if somehow they would be able to uh, – to uh, keep it here in Minnesota on Saturday night. Both fan bases love it. It's going to be uh, another chance uh, for the Little Brown Jug on Saturday night on a night game in Minneapolis on the uh, coast-to-coast stage, so I'm looking forward to it. Here with us today has been uh, Golden Gopher Radio play-by-play voice Mike Grimm. Mike, always great to have you join us, and I know it's only every so often now, but you're a great guest, and we look forward to another visit soon. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it, as always, and it should be, uh, let's hope it's a good game on Saturday night. On Quick Hits today, on our Thursday Michigan Game Day show, we'll have any injury news we can get our hands on, a weather update for Saturday night, and some interesting game day notes as usual. Our guest will be senior editor John Borton from the Wolverine magazine. That does it for another visitor's edition of the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again on Thursday, take care. And as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!